Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Ian, and I'm the owner of Right Start Newcomer Services. Welcome to our first live stream. Uh, so the topic today is investing and insurance in Canada. And we're very excited for you to join us. And hopefully you'll learn something about investing in insurance. And we've got a great guest speaker. Uh, his name is Ryan Walker. And he's going to take us through some of the things we need to know about uh, managing our financial plan in Canada. So uh, just a couple things before we get started. Um, first of all, um, here's my name, my business name, and uh, our website, so you can check us out. And the next thing I wanted to say that this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not considered financial information, sorry, financial advice. Please contact a financial professional and or do your own research before making financial decisions. Okay, so from this, from this presentation, I hopefully um, myself and Ryan will teach you a few things about finances. So the first thing I want you to think about is, um, well, how to learn the basics about managing and protecting your money in Canada. Uh, the second thing we're gonna do is learn about some of the different investment and insurance options here in Canada. Third thing, uh, we're gonna consider your own, I want you to consider your own financial situation and goals. So this is a good chance to think about, you know, the your own financial picture and how you can make things work here in Canada. So the structure of this presentation is going to be uh, Ryan giving a presentation during the first half. And then while during the presentation, you can add your questions to the chat. And then during the second half of the presentation, uh, Ryan will be able to answer those questions. So keep them coming. Uh, thank you for watching. If you're watching the recording, um, you can still comment in the comments section and maybe con uh, Ryan's gonna leave his own contact information so you can get in touch with him after the performance. I guess it's a performance, a live stream. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna add Ryan now to the live stream. Uh, here he is. His name is Ryan Walker and he's with Primerica. So a little bit about Ryan. Uh, Ryan has over 13 years of experience in the financial industry. He's licensed as a branch manager with the Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada. And he's licensed with the superintendent of insurance in every province in Canada. Ryan Walker and his team of 20 plus licensed financial services professionals have the experience, knowledge and the credentials to help you and your family achieve the financial security you're searching for. Great, well, welcome. Ryan, how's it going? Oh, there we go. Sorry, Ian. my mic was on mute. I didn't want oh, to okay. cause any feedback. Great. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, great. Right, so uh, so. I'm going to go into the background. Ryan's going to take over uh, and he's got his presentation here. Ryan, take it away. All right, perfect. So that presentation is just coming right up and we'll go right through it, guys. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. And, and uh, like Ian said, my name is Ryan Walker. I'm so excited to share some info with you tonight. And uh, I will give you some contact. Uh, if, if you enjoy what you see here this evening, by all means, feel free to reach out. Uh, but uh, so that's my info. Like Ian said, I've been in business for 13 years at this point. Uh, that's my wife, Christy with me in the picture there. She's my uh, office manager. We've been in business together for the majority of those years. And so we're uh, you know, a family run business, which is exciting, uh, but we span the country. And so it's, it's a little bigger than a mom and pop shop, but, uh, but still has that feel. And so a few things tonight, folks. Uh, I wanna tell you about our mission statement. Our mission is really to help families earn more income, become properly protected, debt free and financially independent. And so when we talk about getting properly protected, we're actually the largest insurance sales force in North America. The company I represent has more licensed insurance agents than any other company in North America. Ian mentioned that I have uh, over 20 licensed agents myself. And so I'm a small piece of that pie, but we have, uh, we have about uh, 13,000 licensed agents in Canada right now as a whole. It gives us a lot of power to bring great products and services to families. And so we bring a lot of knowledge to the table because of that. Uh, we help people to become debt-free. We offer 
solutions with their debt as well. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that tonight. Not so much. It's really such a unique situation. Everyone's debt is different. So we're really going to spend the bulk of our time in the two bookends of being properly protected and financially independent, helping people with investing and understanding investments in Canada. And so what determines your quality of life? I really believe that it's two th things. It's how we make our money. It's also how we manage our money. Now, here's the million dollar question, everybody. How do most people manage their money? And I think the answer we all pretty much know is for the most part, they don't, right? They're just doing the best they can with what they have. They haven't really sat down and made a written plan for their finance. And so that's where we come in. We help people to do that. And so folks, 41% of Canadians would rather clean the garage or the basement then talk about their finances. And so if we don't talk about things, we can't make them better, right? Just like we gotta go clean up the garage to make it better. We gotta take the time to do it, but it's just a chore that people don't want to get done. And so we help them make it easy. So here's a few other things people don't want. This, uh, sorry, just uh, want one sec if I can I interrupt very, very for one clear. second. I understand. You do not need a goofy sales pitch, okay? You don't need a goofy pitch. You have my promise tonight. You won't be getting one of those. Also, uh, people don't need another financial product necessarily, okay? They, what they need is some solutions, some strategies. So there's some cases where, you know, probably some people need a product, but you don't necessarily need another product. You just need some guidance. And so just like Ian said, uh, this in, in and of itself is not a, a sales pitch okay this is purely information that you can take and go do something with and if you want to reach out to us you certainly can uh so the third thing is you don't need to waste your time and i want to let you know i understand your time is valuable it seems that we have this almost a seven day work week now with so many people working online and so i i want you to realize that tonight i take your time very seriously we're going to deliver some fantastic information that you can take and utilize in your life working with us or on your own. So it's gonna be great info. So what people do need? Well, they need the facts about how money works, okay? They need the facts. Once people have the truth and the facts, then they can make good financial decisions. Here's something to consider with this. Why do people need the truth and the facts? Well, if you think about even the most intelligent person you know, if they lack key information, then they're gonna have a very tough time making the proper decision. They may make the right decision by luck, but if they lack that key information, they can't know they're making the right decision. But if you take a person of average intelligence and they have the truth and the facts, they can make a sound decision. They can know that what they're doing is right. So that's why we wanna equip you tonight with some truth and some facts. Now, what people really need, what people really need is even more important than a product is they need that strategy. Like I was talking about a little earlier, they need a strategy to work with their money. They also need a way to know that what they're doing is the best thing that they're doing with their money. And they need to know how they can get ahead. Okay. How they can actually implement these things and make them work for them. So how many of you want to work until the day you die? And I think the, the, the resounding answer has to be a, like none of you, you on this line. No one wants to do that, right? So we got to plan ahead. So would you say that there's maybe some room to improve? Would you say that everyone you know, including yourself, is doing the absolute best that they can do with their money? Or could there maybe be some room to improve? And I've been doing this for 13 years. I have met very few people. I have met about a handful of people uh, in my career, probably about literally five, that simply could not have any more room to improve. They were doing everything right. But folks, I've met thousands of people. People have room to improve, okay? So three reasons why people aren't doing as well as they'd like to be. One, they have a failure to plan. The next is they're uninformed or they're misinformed. And so I wanna to talk to you about the failure to plan first of all here. Uh, if you think about this, just really practically, uh, think: have you ever been to a wedding before? I think probably all of us on this line have been to a wedding before. Well, if you've ever been to a wedding, think about how long just the average bride and the average uh, uh, bride's mother maybe planned for that wedding. And, and I would say that that's somewhere between, you know, years or even decades. I mean, just since like the moment that that little girl can start dreaming about a wedding, her and her mother start planning that thing. And then to get really serious, 
they probably really plan it for about a year or two, right? And then, then you have the wedding. And that wedding day, that may last about you know, on the longer end, say 24 hours. It's just the whole day from the morning of people getting up and getting ready and getting hair done and makeup and, and all that until the very last dance, it's about a full day. So it's normal, we would think, to plan for a year or two or maybe even more for a one day event, for a one day event. But how much time do people generally spend planning their money, planning their retirement? Think about even a vacation as a shorter example. You know, people leave for a two week vacation, they plan the excursions that they'll do, they plan the different things that they'll do over time on that vacation, they know how much money it's gonna take, but they go on to retirement, which could be a 20 year vacation from the age of 65 to 85, with very little planning done. Folks, it takes more planning. And that's, that's what I wanna stress first of all. Also, people are uninformed, right? They're uninformed. They're just simply not shown how to build a well-constructed financial house, right? And so uh, people, you know, when we think about how to build a financial house, most people are trying to build their, their finances from the top down. They're worried about what's fun. What are some big goals I have? Maybe send the kids to school one day. Let's save some money. Oh, we should get rid of debt. Maybe save a little emergency money. And then finally, they worry about income protection or life insurance. And you wouldn't build a home. You wouldn't build a home uh, in the wrong order, right? You wouldn't try to build it from the roof down, but, but people do it all the time with their finances. Uh, also, with being uninformed, think about this. We've all gone through this system, school, college or university, and then the workforce, or at the very least, we went through school and the workforce, okay? And so where in that system, where in that system do we learn things like the rule of 72, which we'll talk to you about tonight and, and how that works, a key component to how money works. The tax code, right? Especially if you're just coming to Canada, understanding how taxes work here, we have a lot of them. <laughs> uh, compound interest and how that works. Do we learn about the three Ds of successful investing or, or good debt versus bad? How life insurance really works? You know, budgeting versus a spending plan. Where do we learn about those things? And I would submit to you that even if you've been in Canada your entire life, people don't learn about these things through education systems, the banks, they just simply don't get taught. And so, Folks, we're going to talk about that tonight. We're also going to talk about being misinformed. I meet people all the time that say, oh, I got my information from some family and friends, right? I got my information from my parents or banks or coworkers or even accountants. Listen, when it comes to family and friends and coworkers, I just want to say, hey, if people haven't gotten to where you want to go, right, if they don't have evidence of being able to teach legitimate facts about how investments and insurance work in Canada, I would not take that advice. That could be well-meaning advice, but just misinformative. And then also when it comes to banks and accountants, I have a grandmother who works at a bank. I, I think there's great people who work at banks. Uh, she's a lovely lady. If you met my grandma, I'm sure you'd love her. Uh, she works at a bank, but the people at banks are really taught to sell products and not really so much educate. And especially the banking system in Canada is really geared towards debt, right? And so my grandmother, unfortunately, it's not her job to get people out of debt, but unfortunately into debt. And so that's one of the problems with the banks. The other is accountants. Accountants are amazing people. I have an accountant and, uh, and I believe in accounting, but accounting principles and finance principles are not one and the same. Accounting deals for accounting for what happened in the past and finance is planning for the future. And so folks, they're not the same thing. And so we can go to accountants to do what accountants do, but when it comes to planning for the, for the financial future of our family, we need to go to the right source. The next thing is three things that we need to protect our money from, and that's taxation, inflation, and market fluctuation. Now I have some fun examples for these tonight. And so when it comes to taxation, right, the average Canadian gets about a $1,500 uh, uh, tax refund, okay? An average tax refund, about $1,500 in Canada. Now, if you divide that in 12, it's $131 a month. We do not get interest from the government when we get that money. And whose money was that? It was ours. We got it back. People are excited to get it back, but the government didn't give us any interest. 
And so if you think about it, when it comes to the lending game, think of those banks, right? They don't lend money for free. How long will you succeed at lending money if you don't charge any interest? And so I help people dial in their taxes so that they can not get that refund so they don't give a free loan to the government all year and they can actually invest that money throughout the year and get interest for themselves. Okay, so why do we overpay? Well, the main reason is people are afraid. They're afraid to owe the government. And the next is there's a lack of knowledge. They just simply don't know how to dial in what they should be paying for taxes. And so we help people to figure that out. Now, investing 101, there's three main types of accounts in Canada. And you'll learn there's a, re there's a, sorry, a, a registered retirement savings plan. There's a tax-free savings account. And then there's also what's called a non-registered account. Now, for the purposes of this, they're just really buckets that tell us how to get taxed, okay? They tell the government how to tax us with each of the buckets, but we can put anything we want in there. We can put a guaranteed investment certificate, maybe sold by a bank, call it 2%. We can put that in there. We could also put a growth fund, which I'll show you an example of tonight. We could put a mutual fund in there that's maybe averaging between nine to 12%. We can put it in the same bucket. And so the RSP itself doesn't determine what our return is. What we put in determines that. And what we get out is how we get taxed from that, that savings vehicle or that bucket in this case. And so question, shouldn't, shouldn't uh, where, is your money being, where is your money being invested be the question rather than what is it being invested in? See, we need to understand what we're putting it in, but we need to understand first, where are we putting it? And then what are we putting it in? Because these buckets, we can put the same investments into each of those. They, the, everything can have the same investment go into it. We're just gonna learn how we get taxed after the fact. And we can talk more about that on an individual basis, but, but uh, for tonight, just understand that there are three main buckets, RSPs, TFSAs, and, reg and non-registered accounts. We can put anything we want into those. Now. The next is inflation, okay? We talked about taxation, inflation. Here's the power of inflation, folks. So we've got a stamp, a dozen eggs, maybe movie tickets, a liter of gas, just some common items. And in 1981, a stamp was 14 cents, a dozen eggs was 82 cents, a movie ticket was about $2.50, and a liter of gas, just 25 cents. Well, today, a, a stamp is a dollar, a carton of eggs is $4, a movie ticket is uh, $15.50, and a liter of gas is about $1.20, okay? So that's in 40 years. Let's look at in, four, in 2041, what's it gonna be? I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable to think where, what will this cost be into the future? We need to protect our money against the rising cost of goods or inflation. We need to protect against this. It's happening. The next is market fluctuation. Now, I want to talk to you about the rule of 72 tonight. This is something I mentioned I would talk to you about. This was actually uh, discovered really by a gentleman named Albert Einstein. I'm sure you recognize him. Uh, his hair is a little different than mine, but we both have a little bit of uh, extreme hair. Uh, but he said, you can take your rate of return and you can divide it into the number of 72, and that's going to equal the number of years it takes for your money to double. Now, what does that mean? I'll show you. So take your interest rate that you can get on an investment and divide it into 72, and it's going to show you how long it'll double. So let's just say we had $2,000 just as a number, and we wanted to invest that money, and we go and we put it in a, a GIC, maybe at the bank at 3%. Well, three goes into 72, 24 times. So every 24 years, our money will double, okay? So in 24 years, we have 8,000, and in 48 years, we finally have, uh, uh, sorry, 4,000, and then 48 years, we have $8,000. Well, if we double our rate of return, most people would think, well, we should double our end result, but that doesn't allow for the power of compound interest. So if we double our rate of return, look at this, we quadruple, we quadruple our end result. Two, to two times the rate of return quadruple the result. What if we could get 12%? Folks, that same money, that same money grows to a half a million dollars, just $2,000. Now, obviously you would invest more than $2,000 over your life and you may or may not have 48 years. But the point here is if the opportunity exists 
for us to grow money more efficiently over time, shouldn't we know? And that's what we want to help you to understand tonight. So how do you win a game if you don't know the rules? Hey, I really appreciate people coming to our country and, and trying to learn this stuff. Folks, we want to teach you the rules so you understand the, the game that you're in here, right? The money game in Canada might be a little different from wherever you come from originally. And this is a way that you can help yourself to understand to get a better return for your family. Banks and insurance companies don't really have an incentive to teach us these things because if they can make a, a, a higher rate of return for lending out the money than what they give us, they make that difference. And so that's why I like to teach people about how to do this. And so I think just about everyone would benefit from hearing this info. I'm sure you'd agree. And so that's why we work on referrals. And so uh, I, I hope that you find this info valuable and, and refer some folks, but I believe we should have learned this in school. Now you may not have had that opportunity either, but at least you're learning it here tonight. So after that, I do wanna show, now this might be a little small I'm realizing on our screen here, but this is an investment and I'll just use my mouse here. Yeah, that works. It's been around since 1957, okay? This was the very first mutual fund in Canada that allowed Canadian investors to invest outside of Canada and into the American economy. And this invests in big American companies, Amazon's there, I'm sure you've heard of Amazon. There's about 38 companies in here at any given time. Well, this investment has actually got a medium risk rate. It's medium risk, so it's not extremely aggressive. And if you can see it, I hope that you can, I'm not sure, but it's averaged 13% for the last 10 years. So when I was showing you even 12%, there's investments I could show you that have done better than 12 and better than 13. Okay, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of investments out there. We deal with a multitude of investment companies, not just AGF. We are a broker, so we deal with multiple investment companies and we deal all over the country. So there's tons of diversities, tons to learn, but folks, I just want you to know that it is possible. If someone says, hey, you can only get a 3% rate of return, it is definitely possible to get a higher rate. If you leave here tonight with nothing else, know that you can get a higher rate for your family. The power of compound interest. Einstein was quoted as saying compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. That's a powerful quote from that gentleman. Okay. He's a very smart man. So today we have this three-legged stool or we used to really have this three-legged stool. And it was normal in Canada that you would have government benefits when you retired, that you would have your company pension, and you would have personal savings. But today we're seeing a trend that more and more and more people are not having these three. They're getting rid of government benefits. Those are cutting back. Company benefits are getting cut back. And people are having to rely more and more and more on personal savings alone. So folks, it is so important, so imperative that we get a good rate of return on our personal savings. So diversification, okay? Uh, sorry, investing principles, back to the three Ds of investing. Um, so we have discipline, dollar cost averaging, and diversification. Three little examples about investing I'd like to give. So discipline, this is pay yourself first. Maybe you've said this to yourself before. We'll start saving once we get married. Well, now we'll start saving once we have some kids. Well, maybe we'll actually start saving once we get the kids to school. Well, actually, maybe we'll start saving once the kids are married. Maybe we'll start saving once the grandkids come along. Folks, we need to save the whole way through. The whole way through. That's going to allow for compound interest to take effect in our life. Remember the 48 years? We need that time for our money to grow. So it's very important that we start to save something, even if it's $25 a month, start to save something early on and get in that discipline of paying ourselves first. The next is dollar cost averaging. And so I wanna to talk to you about some sheep tonight. I just think this is a fun way to show this. And so let's say you wanted to purchase some sheep, okay? So you wanna purchase some sheep. Here's what dollar cost averaging looks like. What it is, is a way of systematically getting a better price over time when you purchase an investment. We're going to use sheep to keep it simple. So let's say that you said, I'm going to invest in sheep for the next five months and I'm going to put away $100 a month and buy as many sheep as I can with that. And in month number one, month number one, 
uh, uh, sheep costs uh, uh, five or sorry, it costs a hundred dollars. Costs a hundred dollars. So you could buy one sheep. Okay, one sheep. Now the next month the price drops. It goes down, and so it's fifty dollars. So now you could buy two, two sheep. Now, when that happens, would you panic and say, "Oh no, the price has gone down. I should sell my first sheep." No, you wouldn't. You would buy more. But people tend to panic sometimes when the market fluctuates and it goes down, and they think, "Oh, I should leave. I should sell everything I have and leave. I should sell my sheep." It's just not true. We want to buy low. We want to buy more when that's ha happening. So now the next month and the third month, it drops all the way to $25. You might really be tempted to sell your sheep, but if you were smart, you would buy more sheep. You would buy four sheep and stay committed to dollar cost averaging. And then finally, it starts to go back up. The sheep market has improved and now it's, you know, it's, it's two sheep for $100. And finally, it gets back to where the normal price was, one sheep for $100. In the end, your total money that you've invested is $500. The average price of a sheep was $65. You bought 10 in total. Did you ever pay $65 for one sheep though? No, but over time, you got a better overall price than, six, than, than, the, than the individual prices you were buying. And so dollar cost averaging is systematically putting away monthly on a, or money on a monthly basis so that we can get a better price on our investments. Finally, diversification. This is a real simple one. I love this example. If you were ever a kid and you broke a pencil, right? Pretty easy to break a pencil. But if you had that whole batch of pencils and you tried to break those, I don't think there's anyone on this line that could grab all of those at once and break them. And so that's what diversification looks like. A well-managed mutual fund or a mutual fund portfolio has multiple companies and, and even sometimes multiple mutual funds in one portfolio for a family. And we help people to design that so that you have a strong investment rather than a weak one that's uh, really fluctuating a lot with the market. So I want you to take a second and think. Think about family A and family B. Family A, they see this, this information tonight and they say, that's really good information. That's nice. And they kind of just think that's nice and they go away from this presentation and they never really implement anything. Now think about family B. They see this info and they think that's interesting. I would like to get a financial needs analysis done. And they reach out and they get some help. Folks, 20, 30, 40 years from now, which family would you rather be? The family that implemented some of this info or the family that didn't? I think we know which one you would rather be for, for sure. So make sure, reach out. Again, you can definitely contact me. I'd be more than help, happy to help you. You can screenshot that or take a picture with your phone or if you're old school, you can write it down. You'll have a chance at the end of this meeting. I'll put that up one more time. And so that's, again, my, uh, my wife and I, our office address, but we work online across the country. You can reach me by phone or by email. Uh, happy to connect. So everyone's favorite topic, <laughs> life insurance, okay? It's a very boring subject, I do understand that, uh, but I'm gonna try and keep it lighthearted tonight and have some fun and, and make sure that we explain it well so that everybody understands. And so uh, let's talk about, first of all, the textbook definition of what life insurance is. Life insurance is, is something, it's a product that's to create an immediate estate in the event of a premature death. So two things there. One is immediate estate and one is premature death. What do those mean? An immediate estate is money that is on demand, just a quick pile of money, kind of like you see in the, in the bottom right there in that tree. A premature death is when someone dies too soon. Now, unfortunately, none of us live forever, okay? And so if death happens, happens later in life, when it's supposed to happen, when the kids are grown, when the debts are paid, and we have money saved for our family, we shouldn't need life insurance anymore because we're self-insured. The kids are grown, there's no one dependent on us, uh, and we have money saved. We're not going to work for that income anymore. But if it happens premature, earlier in life, we need life insurance there so that it can create that immediate pile of money that we did not have the time to develop ourselves. 
That's what life insurance does. So looking at that textbook definition to create an immediate estate in, a, in the event of a premature death, I want you to think about this. Experts say that there's really two types of insurance. There's term and then there's everything else, whole life, universal life, cash value insurance. And here's some third party references, uh, uh, Charles Gibbons. Uh, he says there, sorry, I'm gonna read from a bigger screen. Uh, I am still, still with you. Uh, there are just three kinds of life insurance, whole life, universal life, and term insurance. The first two are absolute ripoffs. They're not good for people, right? And the third is always the right kind of life insurance, your financial plan, uh, for your financial plan. Whole life is where your money goes into a hole never to be seen again, okay? The next is a, is a lady called Susie Orman, and she says, I'm going to make it incredibly easy for you. All you need to know is that you are to buy term insurance. That's the type of insurance we'll talk about tonight. There are a slew of other types of insurance, such as whole life, universal life, variable life, which are typically known as cash value policies. Ignore them. Don't let anyone, especially an insurance agent who tells you that cash value is better than, than term, they are flat out wrong. They're flat out wrong. Folks, there is one good type of insurance. The rest takes advantage of what people don't know about insurance and how it works. So let me explain this. We teach something called the theory of decreasing responsibility. In the earlier years of life, you may need a lot of insurance. Your need is high because you have young children, high debt, a mortgage, a loss of income while you're working at this point would be devastating. Like I was explaining, a premature death. Over time though, we should save up money. We should have money saved. Our kids should grow up and move out eventually. You know, they get married and leave the home and then our debts are lower or gone. Our mortgage is paid and we're living on retirement income. We're not going to work to bring in money. So if we die, the money still comes in because we weren't having to go to work for it anymore. So we don't need life insurance forever, but we do need to protect against dying too soon or outliving our money. And so that's worth all the investments that we talked about earlier. We want a plan to invest well and not outlive our money. The next thing is uh, uh, I want to ask, think about this. There are two options. So there's cash value, whole life insurance, universal life, variable life, just like those books we're talking about. And how they work is this. They say you have insurance on John and Mary and it's 200,000 each. It's $244 a month. But if you wait till you're age 100 and you don't die, you can get $400,000 out of these because you live to age 100, you can take the money out. The problem is most people don't live till age 100. They also don't want to wait till age 100. So at 65, you say, well, I know it needs time to compound and grow more but I guess I'll just take my money out now. And so you lose the insurance and you have $130,000 to show for it. And people like this because they think, well, I paid for insurance and I got some money back. Let me show you a better option. We teach people to buy term insurance. It's much cheaper. So we have a 35 year level term, okay? And then we have 10,000 on each of the kids, just heaven forbid something were to happen to those children. Uh, then it pays for final expenses. Now this is half the price, less than half the price, really. If the whole idea was get double the coverage for less than half, that's a good idea, but let's go a step further. If we invest that difference, and, and I showed you investments earlier tonight that could do 12, 13%, this is at 9%, so very achievable. If we use that same $244 a month, we have 105 going for insurance, and we have 139 going towards an investment, at age 65, we now have $400,000. Well, over here on the left side, we had 130,000. So now if we live, we could have 400,000 instead of 130. That's, that's better. If we die, we have 400,000 for our family instead of 200,000. I'd say that's better too. So now we have more money if we die and we have more money if we live and it costs the same amount of money as the old plan. Folks, which program would you want? Which program would you want? I, I'm sure it would be the buy term, invest the difference plan. So there's three kinds of term insurance though. Be aware of this. Not all term is the same. There are different types of that product inside that. So there's what's called an annual renewable term. This is where every year your cost of insurance goes up, 
but your coverage stays the same. It is called term insurance, but it isn't a set price for a predetermined amount of time. This is a very expensive, this is the most expensive way practically to buy term insurance. Uh, but there is something slightly more expensive. This annual renewable term will get more expensive over time, but then there is something called credit or mortgage life insurance. This gets sold to people on mortgages as mortgage life insurance. It also gets sold to people on line of credit. Uh, it gets sold in Canada on credit cards. Um, the, U the United States of America has banned this in virtually every state. Uh, Canada has banned the sale of this product in Alberta, but unfortunately it exists in the rest of our country still. And so the way it works is your cost stays the same, but your coverage goes down over time, uh, usually connected to with what you owe on a credit product. So you have less and less and less insurance, but you pay the same amount forever. Um, just simply not a good deal. It's almost the reverse, right, of the annual renewable. What we recommend to people is they get a level term. Insurance where the cost and the coverage stay the same for a predetermined amount of time, usually until your youngest child is 20 or 25, but every plan can be made different. It's, it's you know, unique to each family and what they want, but a level term insurance is what we recommend. So the good news, the good news is this, our goal is to help families achieve financial freedom. We help educate families. I hope you found some education. I'm sure you found this educational tonight, really. So we teach people about how money works. We teach them financial secrets. We just simply don't get taught in school. Now, how most people, they don't plan to fail. They simply fail to plan. Winston Churchill said that, right? Winston Churchill. And so how, how wise would it be to take a road trip somewhere without a GPS, especially let's say if you just arrived to, to our country and you said, well, I want to go to another province or I want to go explore the province that I'm in even, you wouldn't just hop into your car and, and not take your cell phone, at least for a GPS, you would go with a map or a GPS. So think about it. People all the time, they hop into their financial situation and they're just trying to do the best they can with whatever pops up along the way. Folks, you could make it following road signs from one destination to another, but it's going to be frustrating. It's going to take longer than it should. It costs more than it should. And it's the same with your finance. You could do it. You could get from where you are to some sort of retirement, but why not speed up that process, make it easier and less stressful. So the, oh, the problem is traditional financial institutions just sell products we actually like to help people with a solution and put together that customized, confidential and complimentary. We don't charge a fee for this service. We get paid from the companies we send business to, not the families we help. So we will help you put together a financial GPS for your family. Now, we want to build that well-constructed financial host like we were talking about earlier. I won't spend much time on that. We just want to make sure that we have a plan that builds things in the proper order. And that comes with doing a financial needs analysis. That's the blueprints to that plan. And we help families all the time to help them free up an average of between 200 and $1,000 a month by lowering their debt payments, shortening their time in debt, cutting insurance costs and taxes, and even earning better returns on their savings. So I think life is quite simple. Are you happy? If the answer is yes, you just keep doing like what you're doing. If the answer is no, you change something. And then you reevaluate. And it's just the same way. I think that's how you ended up here tonight. You know, it's how you ended up in our great country. You said, I'm not happy with my current situation. And you decided to make an improvement. And then over time, you'll reevaluate. And it's the same thing with your finance, folks. So, again, you can reach myself. I have a, a large team that can help. Uh, there is no need too small or too big. We can help with any size of, of a person's portfolio. Uh, we actually pride ourselves on helping everyday people. Uh, and so for 13 years, I've been able to help families achieve financial freedom, retired countless amounts of families throughout the years and help send kids to school, help to have people buy homes, help to have people, you know, get properly protected. And when they did lose a loved one, I've been there to deliver checks and uh, make sure that that income stream continues to come in for their family. Folks, I appreciate your time tonight. I really do. And I'm sure that you found 
this is to be valuable info. Uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions. I'll stop my share there and invite Ian back if he's okay. still here with us. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for the presentation. That was really awesome. You uh, covered so much good stuff. Uh, I don't really know where to start with the questions. Uh, I've got a lot myself, but let's see if anybody has added any questions in the comments section. So you can do that now. Uh, if there are no questions, then I have a few um, that I can think of. And over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, if you have any comments or questions, add it to the comment section and Ryan will be happy to talk about those things. Okay, so Ryan, I do have a question. Um, a, a former client of mine asked me this yesterday and I think you covered it in your presentation, but let's just discuss it here. So um, her question was, is there private insurance that covers our salary when we retire and how does that compare with RRSPs? So she was saying that some countries have sort of like a private insurance program that you sort of pay into it while you're working and then you get a set, you know, payment every month or week or whatever. So to me, it sounds similar to what you were talking about with whole life policies. Um, yeah, yeah, that does sound similar. Uh, that's a good question. And, and that would be similar to the whole life policies uh, where it would be much better to insure to protect and then invest separately into an RRSP or even a tax savings account, which could be some uh, much more beneficial tax purposes down the road. But that does sound to me a little bit too, like that might be how a pension almost worked in that country. Um, and we do have some jobs here in Canada where you could go to work for maybe the government or some larger companies and they have a pension that you pay into. And at the end you have that coming in. But here it's a lot more self-directed where we have to do it and we set up RSPs, tax savings accounts, et cetera. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I just want to maybe go over those terms because uh, a lot of our viewers might not be familiar with RRSPs and TFSAs. So I know you explained them during your presentation. So really slowly and simply, what is a TFSA and what is an RRSP? Absolutely. And I just want to ask, I'm not sure, I don't want to complicate. Do I have the ability to have a whiteboard here or no? Uh, not that I know of, Ryan, sorry. No, no, no problem, no problem. I just had a really yeah. simple sort of drawing that I use sometimes for that. But okay, so what an RRSP does is it allows us to put in money every year or every month, every week, but we put money in over time and we get a small tax refund on that money. So we pay taxes in Canada throughout the year. And if we put money into an RRSP, a registered retirement savings plan, then what's gonna happen is at the end of the year, when we do our taxes, the government says, oh, because you contributed to that investment, we owe you some tax money back. And so we can get some money back on our taxes. However, when we retire, that money is completely taxable as regular income. So we pay all the tax when we retire. What I suggest to the average family is not everybody. That's why it's an individual basis. But to the average family, it's much more beneficial to put into what's called a tax-free savings account. Now, these can be misinterpreted. because People see savings account and they think it won't make a lot of money. But like I was saying earlier, you can put any investment you want into a TFSA or an RSP or those non-registered accounts. So you can put a great investment into a tax-free savings account. You don't get any tax refund at the end of the year, putting in, in, in through the year on your taxes, but you'll never, ever, ever pay tax on that money again. And so you could get to retirement and have a million, you could have multiple millions of dollars there you don't pay any tax on that money as opposed to an RSP where you pay full taxes and, and a lot would be gone at that point. So I believe for the average family, it's much more beneficial to max out, to put all that they can into a tax-free savings account and have much higher tax savings in the future than a little bit of tax savings now. But again, um, I don't want that to be a blanket statement. It is definitely worth looking into individually. Yeah, great. 
And uh, during your presentation, you talked about these uh, sort of baskets that hold different types of investments. So can you just sort of cover what investments somebody can hold in an RRSP and a TFSA? Because I think they're pretty similar, right? Yeah, actually, any, any investment can go into an RRSP or a TFSA or the non-registered account as well. I'll give you an example. Your non-registered account that everyone on here probably owns is a bank account. Your bank account is actually considered a non-registered investment in Canada. And so if you make too much interest, if you make $50 worth of interest in your bank account, you'll get a tax bill for the year. And so even our bank account is an investment technically. Now, we don't usually have much money in there to make much interest. We put it in other places that will do better, but it is an investment. And so we could have another type of investment that's not a bank account, it's non-registered, and we just put money in there. We don't get a tax refund. We get a tax bill every year, but we don't pay tax as we retire. So we pay tax one, two, but not three times. We pay tax twice. What an RSP does is it allows us to avoid tax one of those times. So we only pay tax once at the end in retirement. So we don't pay tax on the money as, it, as we put it in or as it grows, but we do pay tax in retirement. A TFSA is the reverse. And so a tax-free savings account, we pay our income tax. We don't pay any extra. We just pay our income tax, but we never pay tax on the growth or at retirement. And so that's, that's really how those three accounts work. Um, each has their role and we just need to know what we're using them for. Yeah, great. That's an excellent answer. Um, yeah, so you said they hold any type of investments. So in Canada, you can choose from stocks, uh, mutual funds that Ryan was talking about before. Uh, there's other types of investments like cash, GICs, which Ryan mentioned pretty briefly. So that's sort of an investment that earns annual interest. Um, is there anything I'm missing, Ryan? Are there any other types of investments that somebody could hold in these accounts? Those are the major ones. Uh, there, you know, there is things like uh, maybe uh, ETFs, uh, exchange traded funds. Uh, even, even you can get into property things. There are ways to do that. But you, you, may, you mentioned the main ones. The main ones are GICs, cash, stock or mutual funds. And so G cash is pretty simple. We all know what that is. A GIC is just a guaranteed rate of return. So it's usually a much lower rate of return because the bank is gonna guarantee it, but they're gonna use our money to get a higher rate by lending it. That's why they guarantee us that rate. A stock is just buying an individual piece of an individual company and a mutual fund takes a whole bunch of individual pieces of individual companies and puts it together uh, we actually, the, it, it's, it's funny, the name comes from us mutually, all of us investing into one fund that purchases a whole bunch of stocks. So that's where mutual fund comes from. We can buy that and take less risk. Cool. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, so let me just check if there's any other questions. Uh, I don't see any right now. Um, I do have another question, Ryan. So I follow the stock market and these days people are talking about things like Bitcoin. Um, you know, there was a big thing about Reddit investors pushing up the stock price of different stocks. So, you know, is this really investing or is it sort of like gambling? So is there a difference between investing in the stock market and doing some of these riskier types of investments? Yeah. Um... The way I would answer it, this is a good question. It's a, it's a question definitely for the time. Uh, and the way I would answer that is there is a difference. I, I personally do not invest in Bitcoin. Um, and I don't even invest in individual stocks other than the individual stock of my own company because I'm awarded those shares. I, so <laughs> that's a little mm -hmm. different. But so I believe very traditionally mutual funds, uh, you know, they, they, give the le they give less risk more reward for people is there money to be made in things like bitcoin and, and other areas of course but you have to be ready for the risk those types of investments are very what you call volatile so they go up really fast and they go down really fast and so you always hear the good news people talk about well i know this guy who made this much and this much time and 
they sell that. It's like people who go fishing, right, Ian? Like um, my stepfather, he goes fishing a lot. And he always tells me about the big fish, but he doesn't tell me about the little fish, right? Or the ones that got away, really. And so mm -hmm. it's the same thing when we hear those stories. People get excited about the big windfall, the big amount of money to be made quickly. But they don't talk about the person who lost their life savings doing that. Like, that doesn't get that doesn't sell very well. And so I believe boring traditional methods will equal the best results over time. I'm not talking to people and families about how to get rich quick. I'm talking to them about building wealth over time and not gambling with their finance, but even their emotions. It's very emotional seeing your money go up and down very quickly. And I don't have, I have north, I have quite north of a thousand clients now. I think we're actually about 1600 clients in total roughly. Um, and uh, through my offices and I don't get a lot of calls when the market's turbulent because they're not experiencing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So when the market dives, they call you 24 seven and say, what's going on? Where's my money? Get me out of this thing. Um, is that something that, you know, somebody should do? Should they watch the market carefully day in, day out? Or do you recommend people just, you know, sit back, check it maybe a couple times a year um, just to make sure everything's going okay. Because, you know, I invest in the stock market and I catch myself every day checking the stocks, checking the mutual fund prices. And it sort of drives me a little bit crazy. And I can see how it might keep somebody up at night. So what's your recommendation about frequency of, of checking on your investments? I believe we should be diligent. We should, we should understand our money, for sure. I, I would never say don't watch your money. But I also believe that we could be a little too diligent and we could stress ourselves out. There is going to be fluctuation. Um, I'll say this, pay attention to your money, but ignore the news. And so if the media is saying, oh, the markets are terrible and it's a bad time to invest and they're trying to sell headlines, the media doesn't give financial advice. They sell headlines. They get people to watch. They get people to buy the news, not properly invest. And so their news is too late. If they're reporting that it's bad, that means it already happened. It's too late. And so when they come on the news and then they say, okay, everybody, things look great. It's a good time to invest. It's also too late. We're now buying when everything's up at a really high cost, just like buying the sheep earlier. We want to buy when it's going down. And that's when the news says it's bad. And we want to be able to sell the sheep at a higher price when the, when the money goes up. And that's when the news says it's good. So pay attention to your money but ignore the media. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I like what you explained about the sheep. So dollar cost averaging just means you put money in every month or every two months or whatever, and you'll take advantage of when the price goes down. And you'll also benefit when the price goes up because the overall value of your investments will increase. So yeah, that was a good point with the sheep. I like that. Um, we just have, yeah, about five more minutes. Um, I do have a couple more questions, Ryan. I'll check the comments to see if there are any other questions in there. Nope, not right now. So um, I, I had a lot of clients who, who asked me about things like halal investing. So because a, a lot of Muslim people aren't able to invest in things like interest and there are conditions about things that they're allowed to invest in. So is that something that you can offer is like a halal fund for people? Yes, uh, this is a good question. It's one I don't get to deal with often enough. Actually. Um, and so there certainly are investments I can help people with with that. Uh, there are two major mutual fund companies in Canada that, that really seem to specialize in this. And I would say Fidelity Investments and Invesco. We, we broker for both of those um, and they both offer these types of investments. I have seen, I have seen investments that investment companies will sell that they say are halal investments. Uh, however, digging deeper into the, the investments that are in them, we have to do our due diligence. We have to pay attention. And uh, when we, when we went further into those with people that understood the faith and understood you know, those parameters better than I did. I understand the investment, but, you know, those parameters of the, my clients tend to understand better. We were able to discover that 
there are some companies that will sell these items and they say it is one thing, but they don't even fully understand, I don't believe. And so there's only two companies I would use for that, and that's Fidelity and, and Invesco. And, and we certainly have products with them that do that. Great. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I'll just maybe ask one more question um, because this month is Fraud Awareness Month. So how can people avoid investment scams? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a more unique question. Um, I think if it, if, it, if it sounds strange, you know, you know, trust your gut. And, and I understand too, that if we're talking to a lot of newcomers, maybe everything sounds a little strange. I mean, <laughs> heck, uh, yeah. go down to the waterfront in Halifax, they'll offer you a beaver tail to eat. That sounds a little strange, right? but they're good. Trust uh, so um, you got to kind of trust your instinct a little bit. And so it's, I've seen people uh, suffer. I've actually seen people suffer. Um, uh, what's it called? It's the, it's the company. They ask to send money. It's this little company. I'm trying to think maybe you can help me with that. Ian, uh, but it's a um, company for sending money, sending money. And, and like Western gosh, union, Western union, Western union scams. Uh, and not that Western union is a scam, but it gets utilized a lot. Uh, people get emails for, if you get an email from a strange source and they're asking you to send money on PayPal or Western union, or even just e-transferring uh, someone money, you need to be very careful. And if you're not sure, I think the best thing you could do is talk to a trusted source. Maybe talk to someone like Ian, myself, uh, a trusted family member, someone that has been in the country a while and can say, oh, no, no, don't, don't do that and, and help you avoid those things. But just be diligent and, and be careful. Yeah, good advice. Um, yeah, I, I read somewhere that in Canada, somebody doesn't need... Uh, like a license to call themselves a financial advisor or a financial planner. So are there some credentials that you can look for when you do choose a financial advisor? This is a great question. So, so I myself am not a financial advisor, okay? Uh, I'm not a financial planner. I would be what you call a financial coach. I'm a branch manager for, for a company. I'm licensed by the Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada. So by the, by, that's a very reputable source. It's a federally regulated uh, license. The, you know, provincially I'm licensed with, mu uh, sorry, life insurances. But uh, the titles you're talking about, a financial planner, a financial advisor, CPA, these are people that go to university for, you know, four to eight years to develop uh, really a title that then says, well, I can be called this they tend to focus on people that are quite wealthy because if you spend eight years in school, heck, even four years in school, you have some, you have some debt to pay off probably, right? And you've paid yeah. for them to be able to call yourself a certain title. I would advise for the average person to even be careful in those situations. A lot of the products I was talking about, especially on the life insurance side, um, that are the whole life universal, the investment and insurance in the same package, those get sold a lot of times by people uh, that would call themselves financial advisors. And, and, and that's what happened to my family. That's what got me into this industry 13 years ago. They were taken advantage of by someone who called themselves a financial advisor. And when I started in this company, I was able to show them term insurance and investing the difference. And that's what really sold me on doing this as a career is seeing even my own family was taken advantage of. And, and we grew up here. I mean, this, this is home. And uh, folks, it's scary. It's scary. So you, you want to be careful and, and do your own research. Hey, go to the library and just look up books on insurance and investments. It's the most boring books you could find, I know. But that's real research, not, not Google, right? Go, go find something in the library. Yeah. Okay, that's great advice. So I think our time is pretty much up. Um, I want to show this. So here's a link. So you can write this down and follow this link. This will take you to um, sort of an assessment type thing. It'll ask you a question. And then that can get you in touch with Ryan. So um, write that down, follow that link. And if you want to schedule an appointment with Ryan or someone on his team, you can do that through this link.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, thank you for your time. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you everybody for watching. So if you're watching live, thank you so much. And if you're watching the recording afterwards, thank you for watching. Okay, Thanks. thank you and see you next time. So we'll be back next week, um, same time. So Wednesday evening and next week we'll be talking about mortgages and your credit score here in Canada. Thank you very much. Bye Ryan. Bye-bye, thank you. <laughs>